Welcome to the B. Andrews Radio Show. It is so good to have you here on this 20th day of February. Actually, I'm kind of fibbing. We're recording this on the 19th day of February so that it will be a recording for the 20th day of February. Are you following with me? Are you following with me so far? Are you with me so far? You don't know that song. You're a pastor. <laughs> anyway, um, we're needing to do this recording uh, a day early because uh, over across the other side of the room, the young man that uh, mans our, our desk and get, makes me sound good, makes me look good because, you know, I have a face for radio. He, um, uh, he has a very important job tomorrow and would not be able to be here in order to record this show as a sound engineer. Uh, that's Jonathan over on the other side of the room. Say, hey, John. Hey. And we're trying. Hey. And we're. And we're trying something new today uh, on this particular radio show. We have been gifted a new studio microphone, Ooh. and uh, it is a golden microphone, Ooh. although you can't see that because I, I put the spit guard over it, <laughs> which is good, <laughs> which is very good because I, I spit a lot. And... Um, uh, and so you can't see that, that that it is a golden microphone, but it is absolutely beautiful. It's golden, and uh, we want to thank Pastor Brian for this this extreme gift uh, that he gave to us to help us to <laughs> yeah, rock on, Pastor Brian, to uh, give us uh, the. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, you're so fired up because you know that you're sitting all day tomorrow, don't you? <laughs> Don't remind me. It just like sucks the life out of you. So I'm. Uh, I will be gone tomorrow because I will be inspecting elections. That's the. You're fancy. a poll worker. I'm an election inspector. You're a poll worker. Election inspector. Poll worker. And I I sit in a room all day. Most other places, most other voting places, do it in shifts. The uh, village of Hancock does not. And so the polls open at 7 a.m. and they close at 8 a.m. and you're not allowed to leave. <laughs> Aren't you glad the bathroom's right down the yes, hall? Yes, the bathrooms are right there, I think. <laughs> Thank goodness. So it's going to be a long day tomorrow. We're supposed to have a, a, a sleet storm um, in the overnight. And we were already expecting a very low voter turnout. So I think the all-time low record uh -huh. for voter turnout is three with two of the votes being cast by the election inspectors oh, at the voting place. Oh, snap! I, I, I think I'll have to recheck with them about I that. already know that you're going to beat that tomorrow because there's three people up there working, Yes, and your mom and I, I know, will make it to vote. So well, that makes five. Guys, like, well, I don't know. The ice could be so bad that you just have to stay home. Uh, yeah, no, I don't think that's going to happen. Anyway, <laughs> so, yes, we, we are having a, um, a primary tomorrow. I had to think about what, where we were in that in the election process for uh, Wisconsin State Supreme Court, and that's that's going on tomorrow. There's a lot of things that are converging in these past two weeks at one time. We talked about it last week. Um, we we started Lent. By the way, we're in the middle of Lent season. Let me encourage you to uh, make it out to a house of worship, to go a little bit deeper uh, in your spiritual life during this Lent season. It's a great time to be doing that. So I want, I want to encourage you to get out there, participate, uh, make Lent a part of your life. Um, but here we are. We're, we're coming up on this time of the season. We had uh, B. Andrews Radio Dinner Theater this past Saturday. Shout out to everybody that came out to the show. We we were able to raise just almost a thousand dollars for that show for the B Andrews uh, Radio. Well, not Radio B Andrews Ministry. Period. That goes across. We'll use that to grow across all of our ministry platforms, whether that be our music platform or this particular podcasting platform. Um, that That is where those particular funds will go. And so we thank everybody that came out. want to thank the cast, um, Emily, uh, Ben, Danny, Kyle, Kay, uh, young man across the way from me, John, absolutely awesome job, by the way. Young man across the way from me. 
Pastor Eric. Oh, great job! You're, you're, hey, it, it was it was a fun night. It was a great night. Oh, and I'll get shot if I don't mention the kitchen staff Woo-wee. because it is a dinner theater. And um, the the dinner is actually what most people come out for. I'm not sure what they think about the show, but uh, the food is really good. Um, we got a little, uh, for those of you that listen to the show, we got a little snippet. Somebody recorded a little snippet of the very last act. Uh, it's the Awimawe song. If you were there, you know what that's about. We're, we're desperately going to try to work to get that up on our Facebook page. So uh, you'll want to you wanna look out for that. So all these things converged last week. Valentine's Day was last week. Ash Wednesday was last week. Uh, Lenten season has started. Um, There's just a lot of things that happened last week. Um, we're in tax season. So uh, we're doing rehearsals. I'm up up late at night uh, working on taxes, trying to get that done, because being a, a minister, I have a special system, uh, the, the, there's special way that I have to fill out my 1040, uh, because not only do I get a W-2, but I also have to file a Schedule C for self-employment, and uh, it, it's it's a crazy, crazy deal. Uh, and then we have this ministry, and so I have to file taxes on, on uh, Sonic Demolition Ministries, and oh man, so... By the way, just a public information announcement. Are you guys ready for this? Taxes are due Tuesday, April 17th this year. Oh, so you still have time. Procrastinate, procrastinate, procrastinate. No, don't do that to our radio audience. Tuesday, April 17th. It was reverse psychology. Is that what it is? Get motivated, people. Procrastinate. (laughs) I don't get it. That doesn't work for me. Tuesday, April 17th. Traditionally, it's April 15th. April 15th lands on a Sunday. But what I don't understand is why it isn't April 16th then, immediately just the next day. But for some reason, uh, the federal government and their infinite wisdom has made <laughs> has made it Tuesday, April 17th. So there you go. Um, they only have good ideas. So Yeah. Well, you know, and, in, and then in the midst of all that, last week... Uh, there was a huge national tragedy. I, it, it, it broke our hearts nationwide to to hear about what happened. And I can't. And, and if you think it affected us nationally, I cannot imagine the attitude, um, the sense of loss that is locally where it happened. And I'm talking about the school shooting that happened in Parkland, Florida. And it's it's a tragedy. It's a shame. It's 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 senseless. You you can't wrap your mind and you don't want to try to wrap your mind around that kind of evil that does that kind of an act. Um it's just it's horrific a lot of conversation across the country about that and so i didn't know originally i was thinking wow should that be a part of our conversation today and as we were getting ready to do this show on february the 19th by the way president's day another thing as we were getting ready to do the show and we were doing show prep um john just shoots me a a real quick text and he says i got a great idea let's do good news all show long and i know one of the reasons why he wanted to because last week we took off on our topic so well that john didn't get a chance to get his last week we did last week we did good news last week it was like two weeks before that in a row we didn't I've got the paper right here that you wrote on last that week. Was that, for says, several, that was for several weeks ago. <laughs> Whatever, no, really, dude. We did last week. Last week's, Whatever. Last week's, we did last you week's did, good news. No, we, you go, yeah, we did, we'll have to go to back, back in the track. We'll have to go back and review the notes. Anyway, be that as it is, we've, we've skipped a couple. But, um, you know, John said, why don't we do this all on good news? And in light of what has happened nationally and the national discussion being so heavy, so... Uh, thick, so contentious, 
I said to him, you know what, John? You're absolutely right. Let's We're going to do today's whole show on good news. So each one of our segment is going to be surrounded by one story of good news. So we, today we're going to bring you three stories in each segment, one story in each segment, three stories total of a good news story. All right. So, John, take it away. Okay. This first one comes from CNN. Uh, stories by Lauren Lee. A single dad walked 11 miles to work every day until his co-workers found out. you got to hear this guy's stick to and then catch his age. Trenton Lewis's legs ached from the 11-mile walk he made every morning to get his 4 a.m. shift, and yet the 21-year-old dutifully did it for seven long months. Hmm. He says, uh, here it is. He didn't tell anyone. He's never been one for excuses, especially when it comes to providing for his 14th-month-old daughter, Carmen. My pride is strong, he told CNN. Whatever she needs, I'm the person who is supposed to provide it for her. But his co-workers at a UPS facility in Little Rock, Arkansas, found out, and last week they decided to make things right. They asked Lewis to come to a brief union meeting. When he showed up, his stoic face gave way to disbelief and then a grateful smile as his co-workers handed him keys to a new car. I was emotionally moved. My, my heart just fell, the young worker recalled. When Lewis began working at the UPS facility, he had no means of getting to and from work. I was banking on my feet, he said. So, every morning he walked and kept most of his colleagues in the dark about his pre-dawn journey. But every large workforce has one queen bee who knows all and sees all. For Trenton Lewis, that was Patricia, Mama Pat, Bryant. She was like a second mom, Lewis said. She actually got upset with me when she found out I was walking to work. Bryant and her husband, Kenneth, have both put in almost 40 years at UPS. For a young person to decide in their mind, if I don't have a ride, if I can't get a ride, then I'll walk. Kenneth Bryant said, if a guy can do that, we can pitch in to help. The Bryants quietly shared Lewis's story with their fellow co-workers and took up a collection to buy their determined colleague a car. Most of the employees didn't even know Lewis, but were impressed with his grit. Soon enough, the group raised almost $2,000. Everybody that I talked to said yes. The hardest part was reminding them to bring cash, Kenneth Bryant said. I told the seller what I was doing and who it was for, and he said he was willing to work with me on a price. Bryant wanted everything to be perfect for the big reveal. He even went as far as fixing a small nick on the bumper. The group lured Lewis to the parking lot for that brief union meeting. Kenneth Bryant reached into his pocket, pulled out the keys to the 2006 Saturn Ion, and stunned Lewis. God always has something for you, said Lewis. I'm never going to forget this, ever. Lewis thanked his co-workers profusely. His first ride in the car was to pick up his daughter for a bite to eat. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. That kind of stick to is, you know, and there are things, you know, you and I had this conversation this morning about ministries, sticking with ministries and seeing them through that sometimes that can be the hardest thing, not necessarily just starting the ministry. That is a huge upheaval in itself. But then sticking with a ministry five months, seven months, a year, two years, and to keep going. Now, that's a ministry. I worked for UPS. If he worked at a UPS hub, <laughs> not a center. running off his wheels at work. Right. Not a center. A hub. If he worked for a UPS hub, that's hard work. And that's he, when you get to work. And that's when you get miles. to work. Not the 11 miles to get there. And the 11 miles to get home. Yeah. Because if nobody knew he was doing that, that means he wasn't hitching a ride with anybody. That's right. Not to get there, nor to get home. And seven months he did that. Seven months. So if you worked, I'm going to calculate that on the break, how much that is. But like ugh, that, the stick to to do that. And, and here's something else that people forget. Like walking is supposed to be good for you. There comes a point in time walking on that much asphalt and that much concrete for that long. You tear out your knees. Yep, you do you that. You actually just start or to destroy other, your body. Or like, the, uh, hopefully he was able to lo- walk alongside of a road where he could get into the grass or something like that. Can't when but, you get to the UPS store. Well, no, and let's talk about this. Not only is he walking those miles, but he is also uh, the amount of 
time of the day that it is taking him to do that, it's 11 miles. That's 22 miles. That's a lot of time that's getting eaten up. But, you know, and, and, and we'll reflect a little bit more on that story when we get back. We're going to have another one, one each section, but we're going to talk a little bit more about this. Get a refill on your cup, and let's share some good news today. Hey, if you want to be a part of the show, connect with us on Twitter at B Andrews Band, all lowercase, B-A-N-D-R-E-W-S-B-A-N-D, or I am us at Facebook by going to B Andrews, that's first name B, B-E, last name Andrews, A-N-D-R-E-W-S. Welcome back to the B. Andrews Radio Show. Um, got a really nice Americano going on here. Thank you, John. Uh, You're welcome. And I uh, hope uh, that your drink du jour is uh, matching your uh, requirement of taste today. Yes, it is. It is hitting the spot. It's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is really nice, and uh, thank you, thank you very much. I love a <laughs> love a good hot drink. I love a spike of caffeine. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> I can't, I that's can't just, do Elvis, but I can do Johnny Bravo. <laughs> that's just for you. <laughs> that's just for you, Kyle. We appreciate what you did at the B Andrews Radio Dinner Theater. Give him the lip. Hey, um, I want I want to get back to this uh, Trenton Lewis. Uh, in Arkansas, uh, John was just telling us about this story, and what what a remarkable, remarkable young man, twenty one years old, walking twenty two miles a day, plus the job that he's for getting seven to seven months for seven months, plus the job that he's getting to is a, a not a sit in a chair, whatever kind of job. It's UPS, and that is physical labor, especially if he's working in a hub where he's loading or unloading trailers. That means all the time he's still on his feet while he's at the job. So I, I used to work, I, I, I tried to get on at UPS in Cincinnati at a hub. Um, and when they advertise that they're the tightest ship in the shipping business, they're not whistling dis. They're not whistling a Dix Hay. Um, they're, it, it's a tough job. And um, I, I, I did that. You, here's the one thing that got me. I tried to put myself in his shoes. And I'm thinking 11 miles. Okay. On certain days, that, that's not a bad deal. Okay. Um, 55, 60 degrees in the morning, light jacket, maybe sunrise coming up. <laughs> it could be inspirational. You know what caught me? What about those mornings that it's 60 degrees and raining in, he lives in Arkansas? In freaking Arkansas, which what about those mornings when it's already 80 degrees? <laughs> or, or it's 80 degrees and you're melting down and you're sweating. <sighs> right. Um, but, but I'm talking about the inclement weather. Okay, oh, yeah. and and you're just and you're you're just walking through the rain, or or you know it does get chilly down there at some points in time. That you did it seven months, so we don't know at what particular time of the year that he was doing this. What if he was in one of those cold rains at fifty five degrees? You know, and you're just you're walking. That is discouraging. Yes. Yet seven months. Seven months. And, and he, he wasn't going to stop. And he wasn't going to stop. And he looks at his daughter. That's my inspiration to take care of her, guys out there, other dads, let this story be an inspiration to you for your kids. What's because stopping you? W- w- what's stopping you? This this guy was not going to stop. And he's 21. Okay? He's he's a young buck. And what are most young bucks doing today? Shoot, I'm not doing this. I'll, I'll get me another job. or you, No. He did it. He stuck with it. He was faithful to the job. He was faithful to what he was doing. He was faithful to his family. And 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 ultimately ultimately the job and, and this is the character. The job said that's the kind of employee we want here. 
and and his character spoke volumes for him. Um, during the break, we did a little a little math. Tell tell us about the math that we did, John. So he would have walked in a single week around a hundred and ten miles in a week. He did it for seven months, so that roughly pans out to walking three thousand eighty miles. For seven months, his total would have been somewhere around 3,080 miles. And that's just to and from work. That's not including anything what he else did he might around have done. the job, anywhere else. And so, or what he did on the weekends. What do you think he did on the weekends? The bar. Can I put my feet up? I'm Please, sorry. I mean, like, I would totally get it. So we crunched, we crunched what could you do in 3,080 miles. And in 3,080 miles, you can walk from here. Hancock, Wisconsin, to El Salvador <laughs> in Central America. <laughs> you can do that in 3,026 miles. It, it, crazy enough, <laughs> I mean, it may take you seven months, but you can do it. He walked three He could have walked from Hancock, Wisconsin to El Salvador, Central America. <laughs> that is, uh, right now, I'm saying, yes, Trenton Lewis... Hats off to you. Cups up. Cups, cups up. Cups up dude. to Trenton Lewis. And so now we move on to our next our next good news story. Now this one is again a story about longevity. It says Sister Jean offers comfort, prayer, and a competitive edge for Loyola basketball. Okay. Loyola College? Yes. Okay. Okay. So this story comes from the Chicago Tribune News Service. Okay. okay? So Loyola of Chicago. There yes. are There are two Division One schools by the name of Loyola. Okay. So here's, We're about this to learn Loyola. some of the history about that. Okay. So here we go. So 20 minutes before tip-off in a tunnel leading to the, I, I, it's either Gentile or Gentile Arena basketball court, <laughs> towering <laughs> Loyola players formed a circle around a 98-year-old nun as she quietly prayed. Music thumped, fans screamed, and cheerleaders shook pom-poms on the court in anticipation of Wednesday night's game against Valparaiso. But in the tunnel, Sister Jean Dolores Schmidt spoke softly, holding hands with prayers, uh, with players on each side of her wheelchair. Dear gracious God, she started, she asked for players to remain uninjured and that they play to their potential, as it has before nearly every Loyola home game for decades. Her pregame blessing morphed into advice a coach would give. Don't worry about the opponent's height, the five foot old the five foot nun told the Ramblers. We need your win. <laughs> Sister Jean, as seemingly everyone on campus knows her, has served as the team chaplain since nineteen ninety four. She provides the Ramblers with prayer, comfort, and believe it or not, scouting reports. She's like another coach, senior guard Dante Ingram said. The first game as a freshman, it caught me off guard. I thought she was just going to pray. She prayed, but then she starts saying, You've got to box out and watch out for number twenty two. <laughs> <laughs> she knows her stuff. She's on it. She's not just here to clap, but she's all, but she also lifts you up. There's times I didn't play up to my abilities, and Sister Jean would be like, you'll get them next time, Dante. Sister Jean missed nine home games this season after breaking her hip by falling off a curb, but she has returned for the last three as the first place Ramblers, 22 and 5 and 12 and 3, aim for their first Missouri Valley Conference Championship and first NCAA tournament invitation since 1985. It's great to be back with all of these young people who have who have so much energy, said Sister Jean, who last year was inducted to the university's Athletic Hall of Fame and had a bobblehead made in her likeness. Whoa! Since her fall, she watches games in a wheelchair from a tunnel near the team bench, wearing her Loyola Letterman's jacket, a long maroon and gold scarf, and a pair of Nikes, quietly clapping and nodding when the Ramblers had a shot. Before each game, she also leads the fans in prayer, asking God to help the referees call foul justly <laughs> and asking that the scoreboard at the end indicates a Rambler's win. Uh, Before Wednesday's game, Sister Jean rarely had a moment to herself. Cheerleaders waved to her. The dance team director gave her red roses and chocolates for Valentine's Day. Aww. A woman in the stands approached for a selfie proclaiming, I'm a huge fan of yours. As the Ramblers headed toward the locker room... After pregame warm-ups, warm ups, everyone ran by and gently shook her hand and rested his hand on her shoulder. Some sto- stooped for a hug. In the final moments of the game, former Loyola star and current Nets guard uh, Milton Doyle stopped to chat. This is my NBA guy. 
said Jean. Oh, uh, Jean wow. said, Sister Jean said, proudly. oh, she's proud. <laughs> she's a rock star, said Bill Burns, the school's sports information director. Sister Jean was born in 1919 in San Francisco to a family of sports fans. In high school, from 1933 to 37, she played on the girls' basketball team. For girls at that time, the court was divided into the three sections, and only the forwards could shoot. I was a very short girl, so I didn't shoot, she said. In 1939, Sister Jean said the rules changed to allow girls to play half court. So when she became a teacher and coach at noon during lunch on the playground, I would have the boys play the girls. I told them, I know you have to hold back because you play full court, but we need to make our girls strong. And they did make them strong. In third grade, inspired by her teacher, Sister Jean knew she wanted to become a nun. After high school, she left for Iowa to join the Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary Convent. In 1941, she returned to teach in California where her students included Bob Hope's children. In 1961, she accepted a teaching job at Mundelein College. I might not be saying that right. An all-women's school near Loyola that focused on preparing women to teach in Chicago schools. She attended athletic events at both schools and drove some Mundelein teams uh, to competitions. Mundelein merged with Loyola in 1991, and Sister Jean retired from the education department not long after. She said she served as a booster shooter, checking up on athletes' studies, but not acting as an advisor. When the chaplain of the men's basketball team retired, one of the Jesuits said, How would you like to be the chaplain? She recalled, I said, Well, I've never done it, but that would be fine. (laughs) <laughs> I wanted to be their fair, I wanted to be their friend first of all and be sure to encourage them. They know they can talk to me any time they want. We can pray together. I don't try to take Coach Porter Moser's job, but we talk about people we need to watch on the other side. Moser found a manila envelope on his desk when he was hired in 2011. Sister Jean had left pages of detailed notes on the strengths and weaknesses of each returning player. Oh, I lost my place. She's knowledgeable, Moser said. She watches the game closely. After every game, Sister Jean emails Moser and the players, whether it's good news or bad news. When you win, sometimes you get 100 texts, Moser said. When you lose, it's just my family. Then you get an email (laughs) from Sister Jean. It's so refreshing. It's comforting. Next game, we'll get them. Next game. Mm-hmm. After the 80-71 victory Wednesday, Sister Jean's email to the player said, I must admit that I was a little nervous during parts of the game, and you probably were also, but each of you stepped up and we won a game we needed to win to keep ahead of Southern Illinois. We need to win over Evansville as well. Go Ramblers. Usually, she includes a personal note to each player. After Loyola beat Drake 72-57 on February 7th, she wrote to Ingram, Dante, keep getting those rebounds. That action helps to add more points to the game. Keep making those threes as you did last night, even though those bulldogs were always on your back. Her message to guard Clayton Custer after the game read, They were certainly out to get you. However, your fantastic plays outwitted them and made them nervous. Keep up your great work and don't get injured. She ended. The, Don't get injured. She well, there's the, something every player looks forward to. She ended the email after Wednesday's victory. God bless you and keep winning. She was. Oh, uh, when she was sidelined with her hip injury, she kept up with the Ramblers by watching live play-by-play on website on a website because the hospital television didn't offer the station broadcasting their games. She recorded her traditional pregame prayer for the crowd to be played over the Gentile Arena. Wow, she didn't quit even when she's sidelined. Yep. That's pretty awesome. She's part of us, whether she's with us or not, Moser said. Sister Jean doesn't travel to road games. They would just worry about me, she said. They just need to worry about getting that ball in the basket. She undergoes physical therapy several days a week. She has an office in the student center with a door that's always open and a student usually chatting with her. She lives in a freshman dorm where students pop in to talk about their personal and spiritual growth. She attends mass and women's basketball, soccer, and volleyball games, too. Asked if she's re- if she- asked if she rested before the 7 p.m. tip-off against Valparaiso, she said, nope, no time for naps, or no time for naps. Her competitive spirit, she said, has helped her fight back from the injury. You have to be gutsy, she said. Before a friend pushed her wheelchair back to her room, Sister Jean was asked about Loyola's chance chances to make the NCAA tournament. She thought for a moment, we have to win these games to get there, she said. It's one game at a time for us. Awesome. Absolutely. Now, this story touches me on two levels. <laughs> 
two levels. Number one, I don't know if, how many of our listening audience knows this, but I am a basketball uh, official. And number two, I am working on piloting a chaplaincy program for our our sheriff's department here in Washera County. I think I might have mentioned that on the air one other time. So I'm going to marry those two things together and show my respect uh, for our chaplain here in our story. Um so where did you say we were on time? Uh, we got about 20 seconds. About 20 seconds. All oh, that means time for a refill. Go get your refill. Come on back. And uh, wow, this wow, she is an inspiration. <laughs> she really is an inspiration. <laughs> she sounds awesome. She does. And 98 years old, which, by the way, in 1919, he, she just hasn't had her birthday yet. She will be 99 if she... She will be 99 this year. <laughs> I, I think she's going to make it. Go get that refill and let's come back and we'll talk about this. Uh, it's got a great groove going on. segment of the B. Andrews radio show. We're talking about Sister Jean, who is the chaplain, uh, athletic department chaplain, it sounds like, for Loyola of Chicago, which, by the way, the other Loyola happens to be out in California. It's called Loyola of Marymount. Hmm. Um, well, this one's spelled Loyola with two O's. So I don't know if that's different than the one out in California. Uh, well, is it Loyola or Loyola? Uh, well, now you got me on that one. I don't know. Okay, I thought the schools were the same. Anyway, I'm, I'm aware of that. And you also had mentioned that they were in the uh, Missouri Valley Conference. Well, that's new. They're not original. But you got teams that are changing conferences. Now, I can't even keep up with who's in what conference anymore. <laughs> uh, I used to have like four or five of the conferences, major conferences, memorized all the teams that that were in them. So that doesn't even matter anymore. I mean, the Big Ten has 12 teams in it. <laughs> the Big 12 has 14. I, it was like, well, why don't you guys rename it? You know, <laughs> you know but... Um, in, anyway, uh, but we're talking about her, and uh, you know, I'm a basketball official. I notice that she prays for the referees to 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 call it just to call it justly. To I justly. I think people <laughs> I think people should do that for me before the game starts. <laughs> Because it's not that I don't, especially by what I hear them say when I'm running up and down the floor. You know, I guarantee you they're not saying that wasn't a just call. <laughs> um, and the idea that she is a chaplain, her door is open at n- almost 99 years old. She will turn 99 this year, obviously. Um, that she's and she's in the freshman dorm. Her her room is with the freshman girls. So d- here here, folks, listen to me. Doesn't matter how old you are. God has got a place for you if you will just have a heart 
to put yourself out there. Are you 100 years old yet? Stop complaining. <laughs> That's right. And go and do something that is good and positive and moves and and moves your community and the gospel of Jesus Christ forward. He here this lady had this opportunity. Somebody came to her, well, the old chaplain of the athletic department retired. Would you do it? I mean, being a female and as old as she was when it started, it would have been very easy for her to say no, no, that's 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 not I'm for tired. me. I'm old. I, I, yeah, no, that wasn't. I'm her. elderly and infirm. <laughs> and here she is. She broke her <laughs> hip, and she's in a wheelchair out there. Come on, let's do it. She pre-thought her job to have her prayer time recorded because she was not going to miss the opportunity to pray with that crowd. That's that's awesome. That's awesome, man. What's stopping us? Yeah, what's your excuse? What's our excuse? I mean, that's... I don't have a car. Then walk. Walk. But I'm too old. Are you 100 yet? Yeah. Do it. (laughs) For real. I broke my hip. Record it and send it anyway. I mean, wow. these, These have been... These have been awesome stories. Very challenging. John, thank you for bringing them to us. Thank you for telling us about Trenton Lewis. Thank you for telling us about Sister Jean. But wait a minute. This is the third segment of our show. Do you have one more? This is the third segment of our show. I have one more. You have one more. Lay it on me, guy. Okay. This woman's friends kept a promise for 21 years and counting. This comes from CBS News. Our continuing series, A More Perfect Union, aims to show that what unites us as Americans is far greater than what divides us. In this installment, we look at the healing power of friendship. This is the beginning of the article. More than two decades ago, a group of women in Maryland rallied around their friend Harriet as she battled the debilitating effects of multiple sclerosis. That same group, which goes by the cheeky name Harriet's Harem, (laughs) <laughs> okay <laughs> is, is still keeping her strong a comforting massage a manicure or even just a walk down memory lane this is what harriet's harem is all about 21 years ago harriet fredkins fredkins friends created a caregiving group when multiple sclerosis stole harriet's physical freedom Every Monday through Friday, Harriet gets a visitor, reports CBS News' Chip Reed. Why they do it? It's not just for her, they say. It's good for them, too. Karen Balamasi, uh, problem, I'm sorry. I Let's just call her Karen. Karen B. I'm really sorry for you. <laughs> not for you. I'm sorry for messing up your name. One of the most found, one of the founding members believes it's absolutely better to give than to receive. I think she stimulates all of us, and I love talking to her, but I love listening to her, uh, she said. We both give and receive at the same time. So for me, it's, it is a win-win situation, added Barbara Ranhand, a relative junior member who joined just 11 years ago. She plays Sudoku with Harriet and organizes the calendar every month. Harriet has been very helpful to me in my personal life and whatever I can give back. As I tell her, quote, unquote, Harriet, you saved my life. Now you're stuck with me forever, Renahan said. That's a pretty consistent theme with this group. But Harriet says she has the better end of the deal. She was she most appreciated the communication and conversation. Harriet's husband, Jerry, says the harem gives her a level of support that he can't. I think her worst times are on the weekend when I'm on duty, he joked. And there is no harem here at all. She thrives on the harem. Harriet's daughters agree. The benefits that we see in mom, if other people could use this and also be able to duplicate it, Cheryl Kitt said of her mother, added her one daughter, Ellie. She doesn't think of herself as sick. She just thinks that she can't move. And it's the attitude that really helps. Her family and her harem say that positive outlook on life is Harriet's gift to them. I want people getting out of this to see how wonderful my wife is, Jerry said. This is a happy story, and I want people to understand that this is a happy story. There you go. Um, Number one, person with the right attitude with a disability. Uh, I I have ran into both. I have ran into somebody with a, a nasty attitude that had a disability that was poor me, constantly poor me poor me and 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 you really don't enjoy 
uh, it, well, you struggle being around a person because in one sense, you totally understand they have a disability and, and you do feel sorry for them, but you also feel like they're exploiting you. They're exploiting their situation. And wow, you know, it's and it starts becoming very uncomfortable to be around somebody with a disability that has a bad attitude. On the other side, the, the swinging pendulum on the whole other end of the swing, then you have somebody that has a disability that doesn't even act like they have one. And you watch their attitude. You see them get through life. Um, we were somewhere on a band trip. Maybe you recall this. We went into a McDonald's and no, it wasn't a McDonald's. I remember where we were and it was just last year. It was Syracuse, New York. No, it was two years ago. Syracuse, New York. When did Dalton get married? Cause it was, <laughs> it was after Dalton's wedding. Was that just last year? No, it has to be two years ago because we just Because we just did his one-year anniversary. Okay, so it was two years ago. It was after Dalton's wedding. We were up in the Adirondacks, came through Gloversville. We played there, and we were cutting through Syracuse, and we stopped. We had breakfast the next morning. We went to that restaurant right across from the hotel there outside of Syracuse. And when we went up, that lady, I remember her. She had been working all morning long, doing everything, just bustling around. And I heard her attitude talking to everybody in the restaurant. We went up to go check out. I never paid any attention to her the whole time. Went up to go check out. And when we did, all of a sudden she went to go hand me the money and I looked and she had an arm that was deformed. Hmm. Do you remember that? No, I don't. And she tried to hand us, and she did end up handing us, handing me back my change with that deformed arm. You would have never just listening as she was walking around that restaurant and as she was working, you would never know. And there wasn't one thing that anybody else did that she couldn't do. It wasn't a part of being in the way of her. And her attitude was absolutely, it floored me. When she handed me that back and she didn't think anything about it, it was, she was just, she didn't have a deformity and, and so forth. It took me aback because I looked down there and there was an arm that was only one quarter of the size and only had two fingers on it that of, of her other hand, but she was, it was her right hand and she was right hand dominant. And it reached in. I say it. I and I I, I, I don't mean to be rude in describing, uh, but she reached in the the drawer with that. She pulled out the money. Had to put it in her left hand to be able to extend it to me, to reach across the counter to give me my change. But she was right in. But still a smile on her face, and we were just talking. And I, you could just tell by her edit that wasn't anything. It was totally awesome. Here we are in this story with Harriet. Yeah, um, we had a kid at, um, I, I am a mentor and work at a camp for um, children who had right. been abused. Right. Um, and one of the kids, he um, unfortunately had lost his leg due to abuse when he was very little. Go, um, go ahead and and say so it. Go, go ahead and say how. How he lost his leg. But, well, not, not the how, but the but, why how. Yeah, but he was abused as a, as a little kid, and so he had, he had lost his leg due to that. Due but, to so, the abuse. That's all I wanted you to be able to yeah, say. Yeah, so he um, so he's he comes around to camp, and, and this, this kid, uh, it was my job. Like, I play with him and everything around camp and everything. He scared me to death because he would go, like, he could not wear his prosthesis to the swimming pool. Right. He I remember got around that swimming pool. I was always like, My, is he gonna fall? Is he gonna Nope. My but his balance was <laughs> incredible. We're hopping around like uh around the swimming pool like on he had just one foot, but he could balance no problem and get around and the other little kids and this is what this is what got me, the other little kids came up when they saw his prosthesis and to them it was awesome. It was cool. He looked at the, the other kids gather around, and he's, oh my goodness, he might have been seven at the time. And the other little kids look down at him, and they're like, oh, he's got a robot foot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's that's awesome. Yeah. And, and, he, and he was as active and as in it and everything and as happy. And as I recall, because I had an opportunity to work with him a little bit too, there was no 
poor me it involved in that. I mean, no. he wanted to get out and oh, go oh, and didn't gonna, let... Oh, no, you weren't going to stop him And either. didn't let anything hold he him was, back. He was pretty awesome. One thing I want to bring up about Harriet that is absolutely... that, that comes out strong in the, in the article, and that is the, when the women said, Harriet saved our lives. Because of that attitude, I can almost... I'm reading into this, but I can tell you that because Harriet had a positive attitude it made the other women go, wow, my life's not so bad. I can, if she can do this and get, I can do what I got to do. I can face what I got to face. So ladies and gentlemen, there's your story, your good news. Get out there and be positive. Come back and join us next Tuesday and we're going to help you. This is the B. Andrews Radio Show. See you next time. Brought to you by the HBC, the Hambone Broadcasting Corporation.